Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Todd Compton. We're going to get into some other issues like the Fanny Alger incident, uh, and we'll talk about Sylvia Sessions Lyon. Did, uh, was she having relations with both Windsor and Joseph Smith at the same time? Todd Compton seems to think so. We'll talk about uh, other issues, and Todd will even read some of the lesser-known wives, uh, some of their touching stories. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the, the uh, important things that In Sacred Loneliness brought out was the number of wives that Joseph had, which I know is still kind of disputed. Um, uh, how many did you have in, in Sacred Loneliness? How many did you document? Yeah, well, um, I found another list of Joseph Smith's wives, aside from it wasn't like a modern footnoted list, like the one that was in Von Brody's biography, but it was... Um, uh, it, it was a a good list, and it was it came out. When did it come out? It was um, the Andrew Jensen list, right? Uh, eight, what eighteen eighties was it? Yeah, I should know the Somewhere year around there. And so he had twenty eight in his list. Okay, and so this was really helpful when I found that. And he, you know, a lot of um, Nauvoo veterans were alive. A lot of the plural wives of Joseph Smith were still alive. He could consult with them. William Clayton, you know, who had been in Joseph Smith's private polygamy circle, uh, was alive. And um, so Andrew Jensen had good sources available for, for these, this list. And I think there were 28. Okay. So I accepted all 28 of, of his wives. You know, I felt that he he was he was a good source he was, obviously he wasn't in in Nauvoo but he had a lot of sources there who were in Nauvoo and who were Joseph Smith's plural wives and someone like William Clayton and um, so in fact he was his idea Andrew Jensen's idea was he was going to have little biographies of each of the plural wives just like you do yeah, and um, and in fact, we we have some of the some of the places where he set he set in type the name of one of the plural wives, and then nothing. You know, some of the wives he did have biographies, but you know, some he didn't. And my I suspect it was because of the wives who were married to other husbands. Who I call polyandrous wives. Right. You know, in other words, um, Zina Dantha Huntington was married to Henry Jacobs and had a couple kids with Henry Jacobs. And at the same time, she was married to, she had a, a marriage ceremony with Joseph Smith. And so she was married to Joseph Smith at the same time she was married with William uh, Henry Jacobs. And by the way, this is one thing that was started going on at Huntington is, as I said, as I was trying to find the documents behind these Polly Anders marriages, you know, and trying to document what was going on. And one of my big questions was, did they leave the first husbands when they married Joseph Smith? And so diaries were very helpful. But in fact, Zina Diantha kept a diary through Nauvoo, which was very helpful. And what I came to find was that the these plural wives who were married to other men, they did not leave these other men. They continued to live with these other men and sometimes had children with these other men. And um, and so um, uh, I I was trying to document these these lives and um, find out what was going on and um, but this is this is my theory is that the in Mormon history the plural wives of Joseph Smith became a tab taboo subject okay 
But I think part of the reason was because this issue of Joseph Smith marrying women who were married to other men became like an especially taboo subject. And they didn't know how to explain it. And it's well documented. It, it's, it's well documented. And so I suspect that when, when Andrew Jensen started this project of writing the lives of all these plural wives, when he came across that issue, either he stopped doing the project because he didn't want to write about the, de the details of those kind of marriages because he didn't understand them, or someone, someone else advised him. He said, it'd be a good idea to, you know, not tell the lives of these, you know, women like Zina. You know, but now it's all well documented. You can't ignore it. Right. Um, you know, and someone like Zina, and when I was thinking about the whole issue of writing about Joseph Smith's polygamy in Nauvoo and writing about these women, there was, you know, I was an active member of the church, and um, so I was thinking, is this, is this the right thing for me to do? And one of the things I realized was um, these women are major, major historical figures in Mormon history. And Joseph Smith is a major historical figure, not just in Mormon history, but in American history. You know, and you can't, if you have a major historical figure, you can't just ignore their marriages, you know. And so I came to believe that it was the right thing to do, that, um, you know, what? If I don't document these women, someone else will do it, you know, very quickly. And people had already started doing it, you know. Um, and conservative writers like Danielle Bachman and um, liberal writers like Fawn Brody and Richard Van Wagner. Okay, so Andrew Jensen came up with 28 wives of Joseph Smith, and I accepted all those. And um, then I found a, a few others that are documented in, in other places. And um, there's some sources um, in Nauvoo, some contemporary sources, like the William Clayton Journal Diary. And uh, so I came up with 33 who I felt were well documented that I was satisfied were plural wives of Joseph Smith during his time. However, it isn't that that is not a scientific number, okay? Right. And um, I think Brian Hales came up with a few more too, didn't he? Yeah, Brian Hales, I think he gives 35. Right. And um, what, one thing I did was I had those 33, but then I said possible wives. You know, where there's some documentation, but not quite enough for me yet. And uh, then I had early proxy wives. In other words, they were married to Joseph Smith, like in the Nauvoo Temple. And um, that's evidence that they may have been wives of Joseph Smith. You know, because all of the wives that are well documented, they did have these proxy marriages. However, a couple people had proxy marriages where... They had not been married to Joseph Smith during his lifetime. And like one had Cordelia Morley, had Joseph had proposed to her and she turned him down and then she felt bad after his death and she had a proxy marriage. Oh really? Yeah. And so and so there's it's it's not a scientific thing, you know, and scholars can disagree. And um, I think Richard Bushman in Rough Stone Rolling, he accepted my 33, but he felt one was not adequately documented, so he has 32 on his list. Um, and he, he rejected Lucinda Pendleton, Morgan, Harris, Smith, uh, I forget her last marriage, but she had an early... She was she, the one that was married to William Morgan, the Mason? Yes. Yeah the Masonic martyr. And so she had an early proxy marriage to Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo Temple. And she's on um, J. 
Jensen's list, you know, and so I, I accepted her as a, a, a wife of Joseph Smith. And but you you have other people who are going to have fewer, you know, and then you have people who totally reject that Joseph Smith had polygamy at all, you know. Right. So we disagree on on that. <laughs> um, Do you have anything to say to those people? <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, th I they think... They pop up on my channel all the time. I think the the reliable evidence is overwhelming. You know? I do too. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you can disagree about one piece of evidence and um, states, you know, well, let me put a lot of emphasis on one piece of evidence, but when you have so much that's that's reliable... What do you say to these, those people who say, well, where are the children? Well, first, let me say that some people say, um, okay, Joseph had these marriages. We accept that he had uh, actual marriages. And by that, that's my, uh, I state in, in my book, this is my, you know, how I am judging whether there was a marriage or not. Was there a marriage ceremony? Okay, and so some people have said, okay, we agree there was a marriage ceremony, okay, but there were no, there's no sexual relations and no kids, okay. My point of view is that with marriage, you know, sexual relations and kids is such a standard part of marriage that this is what you expect. And if you think there were absolutely, you know, if there was no sexual relations, it's your burden of proof to, to, to prove that there were no sexual relations. Okay? And there were other special things about the Nauvoo situation, and, and one was that it was very, very secret. So if there are going to be kids, um, they would not be, you know, raised by Joseph Smith in the, you know, Joseph Smith household. And um, and Joseph Smith was not living with his plural wives, you know. In Utah, you have, you know, you might have someone, uh, a polygamist, and he has, say, four wives, and he visits one wife part of the month, the other wife part of the month. He visits them reg regularly and has sexual relations regularly. And... Um, that wasn't the case with Joseph Smith. Um, he had a problem with Emma, okay, and who wouldn't accept polygamy. And even when she accepted the marriage of Emily and Eliza Partridge, she kicked them out of the house um, very soon after. Okay, so Joseph, this was not open polygamy as in Utah. Okay, so. That said, he, you know, there is good documentation that he had, you know, at least these women later testified that he had um, relations with them. In the Temple Lot case. In Temple Lot case, Melissa Lot, and in fact, I have Melissa Lot's testimony in the documents book. Um, that's the only thing I had of hers, but oh, really? It's a, it's an interesting document, and where she, you know, under oath. She testified that there was, I forget her exact language, but she testified that there were sexual relations. You know, Emily Partridge did also. She also testified in the Temple Lot case. And um, so um, here's another document that may have some bearing on, on this issue is that... Uh, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner said, who was a plural wife of Joseph Smith, she said, yes, Joseph Smith, his you know, plural wives had children, and I know three who were raised under other names. Right. Okay. And um, we have... Uh, were these polyandrous marriages or not? 
Mary Elizabeth didn't give us the names of who she was thinking Referring about. Referring to, yeah. Yeah. Because I know there's been DNA tests on six, I believe, possible. Uh, I know the biggest one, the most recent one, was the uh, Sylvia Sessions Lion. Um, and that was ruled that her husband, brother Windsor Lion, right. was, was the father, not Joseph. Right, yeah. Um, and so do you think, especially in that one case, that indicates that she didn't know who the father was? Probably, yes. Okay, but let me get to that in just a second. Okay. Okay. We have another document that says, well, testimony, Ebenezer Robinson, who actually was kind of in the RLDS tradition at that point, who, who kind of had this idea that these were all eternity-only marriages, all of them. And, um, and Ebenezer Robinson, even though he's in that tradition, he said, yes, there was a place in Iowa where the, you know, the, the plural wives would go to have children. Okay. In other words, it wasn't like a public accepted thing in Nauvoo itself, but they would go someplace else and, and have children. And I forget if he, if he was talking about Joseph Smith's children, but okay. So, he was just talking about polygamy. So and, according yeah. to him, that was going on. According to Mary Elizabeth, you know, there were kids who we, we don't have documented as far as names go, but there, there were kids. And um, so, um, you know, uh, in addition to this situation where it was secret Nauvoo polygamy, where Joseph Smith wasn't visiting all his wives regularly. Okay. Um, so now, then we have the um, case of uh, Sylvia Sessions, Lion, Smith, Kimball. Okay. And she, uh, she was daughter of Patty Sessions, known as Patty Sessions. And both Patty and Sylvia married Joseph Smith um, polyandrously. In other words, they were married to other men. Okay, when they married Joseph Smith. And uh, so Sylvia was married to a businessman, Windsor Lyon. And they had a, you know, he had a store and they had a, they're pretty well to do. They had a good house. And um, so she had a daughter in Nauvoo. Uh, named Josephine, and um, raised as Josephine Lyman. And it's interesting, I think she was the only child of Windsor Lyon, Lyon and, and Sylvia. I think she was the only child who survived, was this Josephine Lyon. And... Because um, she had children through other men? No, well, no, she had... Um, well, later she did. Yeah. But uh, with Windsor Lyon, she only had the, had one, the one who survived, Josephine. The, all, all the others died young. She had like four or five kids, and, but they all died young except for Josephine. So flash forward ahead to Utah, and, um, well, a little before that, she married, uh, when all the Mormons went to Utah, she married a non-Mormon here in this area, in, not in this area, in Nauvoo area. And so she stayed, stayed back here and had like three or four kids with this person. And um, so she could have kids. And um, then she decided she wanted to be with her family in Utah. And she left this non-Mormon and um, went to Utah. And so this non-Mormon, he was kind of a banker. Um, he always helped with the with his kids financially in Utah and they would go back and visit him and okay but anyway uh, Sylvia Sessions Lyon ended up in Utah and she was again she was married to also married to Heber C Kimball okay and though she never lived with Heber C Kimball she ended up living in Bountiful near her mother and her brother and so she was approaching debt, and she had, uh, she had kids. And, and so um, 
she had this child who was raised as Josephine Lyon, and Windsor Lyon died, by the way. And uh, she later married someone named Fisher, so her name was Josephine Lyon Fisher, technical name. And But when Sylvia Sessions was approaching death, she called Josephine to her and told her that she was the child of Joseph Smith. Okay, and um, told her a little bit about the circumstances. And much later, um, when Josephine was a bit older, she, she put all this down in an affidavit. And it was uh, Joseph, Joseph F. Smith was collecting affidavits. And he had heard, you know, people heard, people knew that, and this is, there's other evidence of people saying, oh yeah, there's a, there's a woman in Bountiful who has a um, daughter who was child of Joseph Smith from other sources. And um, so Josephine Fisher put this all down in the affidavit and it was legal, you know, the legal document and there were witnesses and so on and so on. Okay. So now, way fast forward into modern times, and um, there's someone, a Mormon, who's a scientist who uh, deals with DNA issues, and so he has um, I am not a scientist, so I don't know how to explain exactly how he has gone ahead, but he has um, felt that he has proven, you know, scientifically that, that Josephine Fisher was not the child of Joseph Smith, that she was the child of um, Windsor Lyon. Right. Okay. Ugo Prego. Ugo Prego. And I'm not a scientist. You know, I would really like to be a scientist and be able to assess this better as a scientist. But, you know, for, for now, I accept it. Okay, and so if we accept it, um, I think we have to agree that that Sylvia Sessions felt that Josephine was the daughter of Joseph Smith. Okay, but however, she was the daughter of Windsor Lyon, and so in one of these polyandrous marriages, she was having sexual relations with Joseph Smith, but also with Windsor Lyon, and um, so. That's, that is what is going on with that. So I think we, we, have, we still have evidence that there was sexual relations in one of these marriages. And this is a polyandrous marriage. So that's how I understand the situation. You know, but again, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm provisionally accepting that, that Josephine was the daughter of Windsor. So one more thing I wanted to talk about was um, I was surprised last night we had dinner and you had dated Fanny Alger's marriage uh, much earlier than I expected. When And was there a marriage ceremony? I guess that, that's a, another good thing. Or was it an affair? Okay, well, your second question I can answer very quickly. Okay. Yes, there was a marriage ceremony. Okay. And as you know, that's important to me because I'm using that as as the criteria for whether there really was a marriage. And um, so here's the story on that one. And again, here we are back in, after I did research in, at the Huntington Library and decided I wanted to continue with my research, and um, I knew I had to go to a lot of different libraries and in Utah. So, you know, and I had family up here so I could... Um, stay with them and go visit these libraries and take my laptop and take notes and transcribe things. You know, again, the internet was in its infancy, so uh, we couldn't get these primary documents online. And uh, so I was, I went, I spent many wonderful weeks at the, um, we called it Church Archives back then. I guess now we call it Church History Library and Archives. And it was in a different building then. And 
And everywhere I went, I told them what I was working on. You know, I decided, you know, they may be less willing to be forthcoming, you know, but I, I thought it was important to tell them what I was working on. So I did tell them I was working on the plural wives of Joseph Smith. You know, but I did tell them I was working on their biographies and, um, you know, which included Nauvoo and Joseph Smith, but I was also doing a lot of work on their later lives and their, you know, I found out to get a good birth date, you needed to know about their younger lives <laughs> often and, and their marriage history and so on. So anyway, I was doing a lot of work at, at church archives. And when I came, you know, it was a lot more open than it had been earlier. And you had, you could just go type in the names of these women. And, you know, the documents had been sorted and um, identified well enough that you, you had good responses when you put in these names. You know, you might, I put in a name and you might have 20 documents I had to look at, you know, which is great. Wonderful. So anyway, um, I'm getting back to Fanny Alger, aren't I? Okay, so I didn't put in, I didn't type in Fanny Alger for this document I'm going to talk about. Um, I knew that Levi Hancock was a prominent Mormon in early Utah. He was part of the Mormon battalion, but he was back in Kirtland. He was back in the Kirtland era, and he was the uncle of Fanny Alger. And, um, and his son was Messiah Hancock, who was the full cousin of Fanny Alger. And um, so they, they came out to Utah, and they wrote memoirs, you know, these autobiographies. And they had been published. And so I had read these published versions. And they'd been published, you know, non-professionally. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's fine. You know, that's wonderful that they had done that. And um, that's a step forward if you have it published in any way. Um, but, you know, uh, a document that's that's published and edited by uh, um, a historian who's been trained in college. They know more about, um, you know, going through identifying the people, uh, getting the, even the transcription. You know, and one thing that happens is people go through a transcription, you know, and, and it's their grandmother and they have, they have no academic background. And so, oh, grandmother misspelled this word, you know, and I better correct that, you know, and oh, this one's misspelled, and I better correct that. And sometimes it's like, uh-oh, here she's talking about a plural marriage we didn't know about and we don't want to know about. <laughs> and <laughs> so that, that, that doesn't go into the tr transcription. And um, so because uh, these these Hancock autobiographies were published in a non, non, you know, scholarly way. I wanted to see the originals, you know, and I love seeing the, the misspellings, you know, and often the way they wrote was how they talked. And um, they talked differently than obviously modern people, but it's really wonderful how they talked. And um, that comes through. And sometimes modern researchers who aren't doing it exactly the way it should be done, like they correct, you know, like, oh, they're using the word ain't. We don't want that. We'll change that to it. So it's, you know, a nice yeah. modern grammatical text. Anyway, so that's why I was looking at the Hancock journals, because he had just mentioned briefly Fanny Alger. Joseph Smith asked him to, will you, you know, when they left Kirtland, will you keep an eye on Fanny? Which is kind of odd because Fanny's family was, was still there. She could have traveled with her parents. 
So that shows a special interest Joseph Smith had. You know, and it's one of these little problems that you want to figure out what's going on. Why this special interest? And um, so, and I, by the way, at this point, I had accepted Fanny Alger. She was on, as a wife of Joseph Smith, she was on Jensen's list, and I had accepted her. And um, another early insider in Nauvoo polygamy was Benjamin Johnson, and he talked about her being a plural wife of Joseph Smith. You know, and it's late, but again, but of course, at that point, it's second hand. He talked about his Joseph Smith's marriage to his, his sisters as a first hand witness, you know, but he wasn't a first hand witness of Fanny Alger marrying Joseph Smith. But anyway, I, I'm saying there were other sources that for, for Fanny being married to Joseph Smith. And um, so I had accepted it at that point. But I wanted to see if are there primary documents behind these you know, typewritten sources that had been published. And there were. So, you know, and so this wasn't like, you could have said, well, this may not be that important because, and I had limited time, because, you know, this isn't Fanny writing, it isn't her brother writing, or anyway. Anyway, but I decided to look through and see what I could find. And the Levi-Hancock document was about the same, you know, but it had that bit about Joseph asked me to take care of Fanny when they left Kirtland. Um, but the Messiah hancock document, he had this section where he's talking about his father. And um, he's talking about his father being in Kirtland. And then he started telling the story of how his father performed the marriage of Fanny Alger to Joseph Smith. And, you know, I had never seen it anywhere else, you know, so this was an exciting discovery for me, you know, yeah. and it was, you know, there was, it wasn't any kind of like, um, you know, like I had made some adventurous journey to, <laughs> to, a uh, long lost relative of Fanny Alger in Illinois or something like that. It, it was just there in the church archives. And I was checking a, a document that had been published in a non scholarly way. And, but anyway, there was this, there was this whole story. And the person who had published that Mosiah Hancock diary just left it out. Yeah, they had edited it out. Oh, you know, wow. and this is exactly why you always need to go and look at the primary document. Wow. You know, and even scholarly, obviously, even scholarly editors, historians make mistakes. So if it's a really important passage, you need to go and look at it yourself. And, um, and I... So you weren't trying to be sneaky and trying to find Fanny Alger's things or this other way. You were just checking the document. Yeah, and I knew it was could be a Fanny Alger document because oh, there had that. been that that little bit in the Levi Hancock document about Joseph Smith told me to take care of Fanny. And, but anyway, in the Messiah Hancock, I got this whole story. And um, so... He said, Joseph Smith said to Levi, Levi, you know, will you help me marry Fanny? You know, and if you do, I will help you marry Clarissa Reed. And um, so there was like, you know, Joseph Smith was making a, an agreement, you know, I'll help you with this if you help me with this. And Levi Hancock said, yes, okay, I'll help you, Joseph. And, and, I, I th and it says explicitly that 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 Levi performed a marriage ceremony. Okay, so does it have a date in there? No, no date. Oh, okay. Okay, but it is linked with this Levi Hancock's marriage. Okay, where Joseph Smith helped him marry oh, this the, the this quid pro quo. All right, <laughs> right. So it's linked with that marriage, and that marriage is. Well documented is 1833. 
See, and here's part of the problems we have with polygamy, providing we accept that that Mazai Hancock account, is the, the, the regular civil marriage is well documented. You know, lots of people come to the wedding, you know, and... And this it, is often the, it's written in the the family Bible, and all kinds of ways it's documented in, you know, for a regular marriage. But but the Fanny Alger marriage wasn't documented at all like that. It wasn't public and um, it was secret. Right. You know, however, Levi Hancock, if we accept the story, Levi Hancock told it to his son Messiah. And Messiah wrote it down in his memoir. Okay. Now, we've been talking about analyzing documents. This is a late document. Okay. So, some people just say it's a late document. We have to reject it. Right. Okay. And I'm not like, you know, I'm definitely not like that. Okay. And so, we look, you know, one thing you do is you look at it. Does it make sense? Um... Is this something Joseph Smith would do? Is um, and the people who think that the Fanny Alger, you know, relationship was a an affair, they're thinking that okay, they don't, you know, we don't like there being an affair, so we want to show that it was a marriage, okay, and so that's why they're putting that marriage in there. Um, so, and um, we have all these issues with, with late documents, okay? And people who are interested in the Fanny Alger relationship being an affair, they're not going to like this document, okay? Right. So, um, I, I accept the document. I accept that it happened this way, okay? And... One one thing is that if it's an anecdote, if it's an you know, it isn't as likely to be um, a fabrication if it's a uh, you know a, an expanded anecdote, you know, because people wouldn't lie at great lengths in theory, though it can happen. Okay, so. I'm saying, and now we don't we don't have a diary from the same period, so we're always looking for um, for documentation that will support it. But um, we have a situation where I accept it, and another historian can be, you know, a, a, another good historian mm -hmm. with and using their judgment, they can say, I don't accept that. Okay. Well, because Don Bradley is given a scenario where he thinks it's as late, it's after the dedication of the Curtain Temple in 1836. So you've got it three years earlier. Yeah. Um, the The benefit of 1836 is Moses and Elijah and Elias have come and restored mm -hmm. the sealing power. 1833, that hasn't happened. Um, yeah. You know, and so, because I had always heard, it seems like. From my opinion, most people reject both 1833 and 18, too soon and too late, 1836, and so 34, 35. Um, and so, I mean, do you have any so comment on that? What what they need to do if they re, you know if they say, I don't believe it, they need to say, here's why I don't believe it is because I don't think it makes sense that it would happen in this way, mm -hmm. you know, and deal with the story. And also, um, and also say yes, it's late. Okay. And uh, also, there's maybe a dating problem, you know, and we don't like that it's happening before a certain event or something like that. We don't think it would happen like that. And um, so, I think they have to deal with the story. What I'm saying right. is, they have to deal with that story and say. I reject it for these reasons. Okay. But what I don't like is when they just say Fanny Alger was had an affair, and then they don't deal with the story, the Hancock story. And in support of the Hancock story, even if it's late, is 
this was a first-hand account. Levi, Levi Hancock, well, when he told Messiah, it was a first-hand account. Um, he, you know, he was a witness. It's a, you know, and these people, Levi and Messiah, were closely related to to Fanny Alger, to the right. Alger family. Right. Okay, that's in favor of the story, and um, and so. Um, what they need to do is they need to deal with that story and say why they reject it. And often they're not doing that. So, you know, it's an important story. It's an important family tradition. You know, it needs so, to be part of anyone if they're dealing with, with Fanny Alger. You know, they need to have that in there and say, we reject this for this reasons. And they're not do often they're not doing that. Right. So, so if it's 1833... Um, oh, I have to... I think... Brian Hales, in his book, Brian, yeah. he accepts the Fanny Alger story. I mean, the Levi Hancock story. And Bushman accepts it, too. Okay. However, then, even though there's this connection with the marriage of Clarissa Reed to Levi. In 1833. Yeah. Who I think you've got to, you're kind of stuck with that 1833 mm -hmm. um, date. He dates it to 1835. Right. And he says, he, he says the, Benjamin, the Benjamin Johnson document supports 1835. And this is an interesting example of how you're using two documents, you know, to, to create the whole story. Right. But Benjamin Johnson wasn't, he wasn't a first-hand um, a first-hand witness, and he wasn't, even though he was in Kirtland, and he wasn't uh, uh, part of the family of, of Fanny Alger and, and Hancock, and so, um, and and Brian really hasn't explained the, you know, how the the marriage of Levi Hancock to Clarissa is still there, and so, but so he he accepts. The Hancock story, but he he still dates it later. Right, right. And I it doesn't work for me, but so as far and I as think Don Bradley, I think he's working on Fanny Alger um, right now, you know, and putting more stuff together. Uh, I think he just totally rejects the Hancock story, though. In what I've read of his, he didn't do what I think they should do. Is is you know, look at it in detail and and explain why you reject it. So, if he finally publishes it in a book or something, I think he he should do that. Okay, because <laughs> I know he has that one essay in Persistence of Polygamy. Is that volume three? I can't. Remember. And of course, I'm biased. I found oh, yeah, that yeah. I found that document. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but so I guess my question is though, um, if it happened in 1832, let's assume it did. Yeah. Um, that's before the sealing power was restored, right? Mm -hmm. So is this just an, another ma marriage without being sealed in heaven? Or, I mean, do you have any comment on that? I mean, that's more of a theological um, question, I guess. Yeah. But. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. And I also date the Lucinda Pendleton uh, Morgan Harris right. marriage in 1838 in okay. Missouri. In Missouri, right yeah. Right in Missouri. Probably right up in far west where oh, we were okay. oh at the temple site around there you yeah. know they they lived in they lived in far west um she and her first husband george harris oh okay uh george was her no William and so was a lot of husband. this a lot of this um a theological development that happened in nauvoo wasn't around you know things were a lot less theologically developed right Okay, so it might not have been a marriage for eternity, but, you know, and one of the really important things about that Hancock document is that he says specifically there was a marriage ceremony. Right. Okay, and so we know it was a, a marriage with a ceremony. Yeah. You know, and I'm accepting that Lucinda Pendleton was too in 1838. Okay. So... so. And I'm, be, you know, I don't know if you're picking it up, but I'm being conservative to moderate quite a bit of the time. Whereas 
when my book came out, you know, some conservatives really attacked me as this horrible, you know, Liberal. person who's attacking Joseph Smith and so on. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, well, let me throw one more thing out at you. So, because I talked to Mark Staker, and one of the things that he said was, well, in 18... I know there's a discrepancy on the date when the Mechizek priesthood was restored, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick the latest date, which is 1831. Uh, still before 1833, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the, when the Melchizedek priesthood was restored, Peter, James, and John gave Joseph the sealing power. And so, even if you want to go with 1833 as the Fanny Alger sealing, Mark says, well, Joseph had the sealing power, although Oliver Cowdery certainly didn't understand it that way. <laughs> you know, um, do you have a comment the, on the that? The word seal meant something different back in Nauvoo, I think. The, okay. and, and if you look at my um, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner chapter. Um, in the documents? or in the, It's in the documents. Yeah. And it's in the other book, too. Okay. Whereas the, the Levi Hancock document isn't in here because a woman didn't write it. Oh, okay. And the so you have to go Benjamin, to the first book for that one. Yeah, you have to go different places. And Levi and the um, Benjamin Johnson document isn't in here because he wasn't one of the plural wives of Joseph Smith and and you know and if I'd included everything you know that men wrote about it's already you know or other pages. women you know it would be too long so. yeah. but that would have been nice to do that yeah. but it's nice just having their words themselves it's right. really wonderful so in Sacred Loneliness, there's a real female spirit. Did your wife have any input on, on how that was? And our friend Jenna asked this. I don't yeah. know if you could hear it all. What, what, do you want your last name in there? <laughs> I don't know your last name. But anyway, she asked uh, about that. And if my wife had an impact on how I wrote it and, and researched it and so on. And see, here's where you need to know marriage dates. <laughs> and... Um, when I got married, this In Sacred Loneliness was already published. Okay. Possibly it was, you know, the impact of my mother, and I have wonderful sisters, great sisters, and so, you know, and I've had great friends who are women through the years. At UCLA, I had, you know, graduate student friends who were women who were really close friends, and, um, uh, the one of my friends who's a woman, he's, she's the one who said, Todd, you ought to apply for this Huntington Fellowship. <laughs> you know, and it never would have happened unless she'd done that. Yeah. So anyway, um, and uh, I guess you could just say I was overwhelmed by the power of what they wrote, you know, <laughs> sometimes. And um, another of my great discoveries just at the church history library. And so I hope it's coming through that I had a great experience with the church history library. Yeah. You know, and they still have some things that are not, you know, that are still restricted, but they had so much that was um, available and easy to find um, that I had a wonderful experience and I was really able to fill out all of those biographies I'd started. And... Um, one experience I had was kind of like the Levi Hancock experience, but um, we have this one woman named um, Louisa Beeman Smith Young. And um, so she was the first plural marriage in Nauvoo. You know, so she's well known for that. And we have accounts about that marriage. 1841, I think. Is that about right? Yeah, though, you know, we've got alternate dates on, since my book came out, we got a, in the, in the Wilfred Woodruff writings, he had a list of like four women, you know, some of these early women, and it might have included Louisa, it included definitely Zina, Diantha Huntington, Jacob Smith Young, and, um, but, so he had the dates of their marriage, which is good. You know, it's good we have attestation. But he put them all a year earlier. 
you know, like 1840. Oh, okay. So I forget if Louisa Beeman was one of those, but so we have an alternate date. And some, you know, really good scholars, good historians have looked at those dates and worked with those 1840 dates, and they think they're preferable. And I'm, I'm still thinking there's, you know, there's kind of a weight of evidence for those 1841 dates. So I'm kind of preferring the 1841 dates, but I think those 1840 dates are very, you know, very possible. You know, and it's really, that's really an important document in that Wilfred Woodruff paper, you know. I think it's a loose paper in his, in his diaries, something like that, hmm. you know, that he, we, we, he, he had a date. It's wonderful we have a date and that he had, you know, and it's, it's both frustrating and, and interesting and attractive that he has a different date, hmm. you know. And so, yeah, one thing in history we've been talking about, the craft of history, as we've been talking here, is right. often you have conflicts. You know, like, here, here's this, I, I, I mentioned how often you have pieces of, pieces of the puzzle, you have different documents, you put them together and they make a unified source. But sometimes you have different documents and you try to put them together and they don't fit at all. all right. And then you, you have to worry about how to try to, why aren't they, why are they contradicting each other? You know, which one is preferable? Or are they both... Are they both half wrong and half right? You know, <laughs> or is, anyway. So, let's see. How did I get onto that? Um, well, we're oh, to... the 1840 dates. Right. Okay, but yes, I think. Or even I the 1833. Think, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that she was the first, and she was married in Nauvoo. She was the first married in Nauvoo, and it was 1841. Okay. <laughs> and then, then back to the ceiling. Oh, Do you care about that issue at all? I or? haven't gone into the um, looking at those early marriages and wondering about the, the theological you know, implications. The theological, I guess. and I'll tell you that story from that Mary Elizabeth Rollins Light, Lightner autobiography, and that's a wonderful document. She's a great storyteller, um, and the, what she went through in her life is really, really interesting. And um, she's one who was a plural wife of Joseph Smith, but she was married to another man um, who was a non-Mormon, uh, and um, Adam Leitner. And so he was there with her in here in in Missouri. We're we're here in Independence, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so Mary Elizabeth Rollins has a really nice section on her living in Independence, Missouri, and she was good friends with Lilburn W. Boggs. And, really? Yeah, and she oh my, made that's... clothes for Lilburn W. Boggs. And, um, that's quite a connection. And then she married this non-Mormon. Um, but she also has a section on... on oh, and I was going to mention that in Nauvoo... So she's married to Adam Leitner and has kids with him, and Joseph Smith proposes to her, and she tells, you know, the kind of language he uses. And what he says is, is the motivation and why she should marry him. And that's really a remarkable document. Because, um, and again, it's late, it's retrospective, you know, but again, I don't, I don't reject anything simply because it's late. You know, it's worth taking. You know, it's worth looking at and mm -hmm. comparing it with other documents and putting it into the picture. Anyway, so it's a really remarkable document. The and that the full thing is the whole thing is in this book. Mm -hmm. um, in the other book, the first book, I have liberal quotations from it, but the whole thing is in here, and it's really worth reading the whole thing. And um, so. Let's see. Oh, so she has a Kirtland section, and she has a section on um, the Book of Mormon, and her first experiences reading the Book of Mormon before Joseph Smith visited, and then she has a full section about how he visited, and then there's a there's a sealing meeting, and Joseph Smith seals up this whole group, you know, to be with him in the next life. And the idea is sealing is kind of liking, like putting a seal on someone, and you know that will 
that will be with them in the next life, and they'll go up into the highest sections of the celestial kingdom. You know, and, and later, sealing came to mean this connection idea, you know, of connecting people. Though that's probably related to the original idea is you put a seal on someone. And so Joseph Smith would go around and, and other people would go around and seal up all, whole congregations, you know, to, into salvation. And just an example of how the, the theology was different back then. Mm -hmm. and of course, some people, you know, good historians, they just say, I, I reject Andrew Jensen. You know, like, I think he was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so they, they do not accept Fanny Alger. And he, he had his first two are Fanny Alger and Lucinda Pendleton, uh, Morgan Harris. Um, and so some people just simply accept those as wives of Joseph Smith, where I, I accept them. And that's kind of a moderate kind of point of view, you mm -hmm. know. Because <laughs> some people think that... Um, you have to you have to accept them as not marriages, you know. But I, you know, if they want to, they can make a case that they were not marriages. I can see that, you know. And you know, good historians could make a case, you know. And you could reject Andrew Jensen, you know, on good grounds, you know. Say he's he obviously he wasn't there in Nauvoo. He's not a first-hand witness, and and it's late and. Um, so on and so on, but I'm just saying I do accept them as as um, plural wives of Joseph Smith which, with marriage ceremonies. But I've never actually examined what the theology of the marriages would have been. But okay. obviously, I don't see it as Nauvoo theology back back then. Um, I I just assume they were probably regular marriages with regular marriage vows, but we, you know, with the standard religious um, religious elements to them. It would be great to know if there was anything about being married in the eternities, but I don't know. Okay. I assume all of, all of them in Nauvoo were marriages for eternity. Though, again, we don't um, we don't have exact records of what the marriage ceremonies were like. You know, but for like that first one, um, Louisa Beeman, the first in Nauvoo, we, uh, the person who performed the marriage, Joseph Noble, um, he, you know, he gave really good testimony that there was a marriage ceremony and where it was done on the bank of the river. Um, and, and so, you know, I think Definitely, there were marriage ceremonies, which is one of the things I was interested yeah, in. Yeah, that was one of your criteria. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, I know I've kept you a long time. Uh, what I thought we could do, maybe to finish up, do you have any favorite stories from, uh, <laughs> from this book that you'd like to share? You know, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, I had to read a little bit from, from, from this book. And um, in the end... Um, I was just talking about Louisa Beeman, and um, like I'm attached to a lot of these women, and some of the women, there's, there's hardly any documentation at all, so you can't get as attached to them. Right. Uh, but like like Maria Lawrence, you know, we know very little about her, and she wrote nothing that we know about, you know. So some of them, because they've written a lot, you get more attached to them. Right. Okay, and so. Louisa Beeman, we just knew her as this first plural wife in Nauvoo. And, um, and there are a few references to her in like the Sylvia, I mean the Patty Sessions diary and the Eliza Snow diary. But she didn't, she didn't have a personality, you know, in her, in her own right. And then that one day, you know, I walked into the church history library and um, typed in Louisa Young or Louisa Beeman Young or something like that and um, there it was she, she had written some letters oh, she nice. had written letters that were uh, written to another plural wife of Joseph Smith Marinda uh, Marinda Johnson Hyde Smith mm -hmm. and wife of Orson Hyde 
And um, so I, you know, ordered them and uh, I, I saw, you know, I, I saw all of this on microfilm and r rolled it up and started reading. And um, there were letters she had written in Utah to uh, Marinda Hyde, Marinda Hyde, who is in, um, not winter quarters, but um, across the river, Canesville, or Council Bluff. And so um, the first one is dated April 8, 1849. And she had a really she, she wrote like she talked, you can tell. So it was really wonderful. To, it was like hearing her speak. And so all of a sudden, she came alive, you know, oh. as I was reading that in the, in the reading room at Church Archives. Okay, so let me just read this passage. And um, she, after Joseph Smith had died, she married Brigham Young. And she had... Her, her first kids were twins to Brigham Young. Wow. Named Joseph and Hiram, and oh, wow. <laughs> they died as children. Oh. Um, I, I think really soon after leaving Nauvoo, they died. Uh, and then she was in winter quarters, and she had another son, another child, and named Moroni, and um, he died in, in winter quarters. So she had lost three children. And um, so she crossed the plains in um, 1848. And in April 8, 1849, she writes to actually Mirinda and two of Mirinda's sister wives um, in the Hyde family. OK, and um, after her initial greeting, she writes, Oh, and I read this yesterday in my talk, and um, I had a hard time reading it. So let's see if I can get through this, <laughs> because it's so tragic. Okay. I am led to think at times there is not much else but sorrow and affliction in this world for me. The next day after I arrived in the valley, Oh, I left out. Cro while she was crossing the plains, she had another set of twins. Okay? And so she was caring for them as twins, you know, all the way into Salt Lake City, and um, they made it to Salt Lake City. Okay. I am led to think at times there is not much else but sorrow and affliction in this world for me. The next day after I arrived in the valley, my babes were both taken sick with the bowel complaint. The canker set in, and on the 11th of October, I was called upon to give up the oldest one, and his little spirit took its flight to join with his brothers and father in heaven. My anxiety was all turned toward the other that was living. The next day after this one was buried, the other commenced to get better. He got so that he seemed well and grew fleshy as fast as ever I saw a child, and I even dared to hope that I should raise him. But I no sooner hoped than my hopes were all blasted one day, all in a moment. As it were, he was taken down again with the same complaint, and all I could do, both by faith and works, did not seem to do any good. And on the 16th of November, he breathed his last, and I was again left alone. You that have been mothers and lost children can better imagine my feelings than I can describe them. I had fondly hoped I should raise them. They looked very much alike indeed. Their eyes were just of a color. I called them Alva and Alma, but they are gone, and I must be reconciled to the will of God. And I desire ever to acknowledge his hand in all things. I look forward to the time when I shall again behold them and clasp them to my bosom. Will not my joy be full? So, 
hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough. But beautifully written. It's a beautiful account of her experience. And she went on and had major health problems in the next, in the next year or two and um, died of breast cancer. Oh. So, you know, what a tragic life. But, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone loved her. You know, so <laughs> I was, I shouldn't have tried to do this. <laughs> this is kind of what happened yesterday. <laughs> but um, I was so thrilled to find that document and to have her come to life Yeah. Um, the way she did. Did, did you have that the, in the... First book, or was that, that for this? Book? I I you did have it. Gave that excerpt in the first book. Okay. Yeah. So, the story is definitely there. Yeah. Um, but in this book, you have the whole letter. Mm -hmm. So she goes on and tells about what life was like in early Salt Lake City, and um, chatty, you know, and you can see what kind of a person she was, and um, and it's a nice record. For historians, it's a nice record of early Salt Lake City, too. Um, and, you know, on the bus trip yesterday, I was um, just in things people said. They were talking about different people, and um, they were talking about how they lost kids. Yeah. And they, they lost kids more than we do. Oh, much more. You know, and so... I kind of focus on this because uh, Louisa was, you know, it's such a beautiful letter. Um, and also because she lost all her kids, you know, all five kids, and then died so tragically herself. But, you know, like this, this wasn't an uncommon experience among the pioneers in early America. Um, and Patty Sessions, she had like eight kids with her first husband. And, um, you know, like only two or three survived. And often you had these diseases that came through a town and killed off a whole bunch of people. And people going west on the plains, cholera was, a lot of people died right. from cholera crossing the plains. So, I mean, she isn't, obviously she isn't unique, but um, it's such a beautiful letter that, you know, it really stands out. Um, okay, anything else? Now, did we want another reading? It's up to you. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say, do you have anything else you want to share? Well, there's, you know, the problem is deciding what. <laughs> <laughs> I could read the other um, thing I read yesterday. And this is a really, uh, it's another letter, and um, this is a really interesting woman, um, and she's known as Ina Coolbreath, and she's known as the first poet laureate of California. She wrote poetry, and is quite well known for that. She was a friend of people like Bret Hart and Mark Twain and um, uh, John Muir, close friends with John Muir, and that whole circle, that whole literary circle in early San Francisco. And I like this because these are women we don't normally hear about. <laughs> we hear about Fanny <laughs> Alger and all these other ones. But. Yeah, and um, People who have read about, she's become fairly famous, and there have been a couple of biographies written about her by non-Mormons. And, um, but she was the daughter of Don Carlos Smith, Joseph Smith's brother. Right. And so she was um, the niece of Joseph Smith, I guess. And um, so her mother 
Agnes Coolbreath. Where is it? There it is. 113. Okay. Smith, Smith, Smith Pickett. She, um, she had been the wife of Don Carlos Smith, and he died in Nauvoo. And um, then she, uh, she married Joseph Smith, and he died. And um, she married, uh, who was it? Was it George R., George A. Smith? Who was but, a cousin, right? Yeah. And, uh, but then she married a kind of a lapsed Mormon, or a Mormon who became a lapsed Mormon, named William Pickett. She had twins with him, and they, they grew up and um, grew up in California and kind of followed after their father in, in some ways. And um, okay, and so, um, so William wanted to go to California to the, to the gold rush, and that's why Ina ended up in California. And um, so we have some really great, fun letters written by her when she was living in California, uh, Los Angeles. And um, the, she's written the letters to Joseph F. Smith, who was her cousin, and he was on a mission in, in Hawaii. And so they were able to exchange these letters um, to each other, and they've been saved. And um, so in Los Angeles, not, not too far away, was San Bernardino. And before 1857, there was that big Mormon community in San Bernardino. And so Agnes and Ina would go visit. And uh, so we have accounts of them visiting from the diaries of the people there. And um, they had visited Utah for a while, but they came with Pickett to California and were living at this time, at the time of the letter I'm going to read from in 1857. And um, so um, it would be interesting to have a long interview with Ina about <laughs> how she felt about, you know, what was happening with her Mormon background. And later in her life, people didn't know she had a Mormon background. You know, she was just this famous poetess. And um, however, in this um, letter she, she wrote to Joseph F. Smith in 1857, she kind of went on a tirade against polygamy. And uh, it's a pretty interesting, and this, this paragraph is a really interesting passage. And you can see she was really a bright person and a lively writer. And um, so, and I include these whole letters. Um, you just don't have the paragraph, you have the whole letters. So it's fun, obviously, to read the whole letters. Okay. And she writes to Joseph F. Smith, who later became a full polygamist with like six wives and something like 40 kids or something like that. Um, is it right for a girl of 15 and even 16 to marry a man of 50 or 60? Can there be any love there? And has not God willed a woman to love, honor, and obey her husband? And can it be right thus to pledge false vows at the altar in perfect mockery of all that is good and pure in God's most holy laws? I think I see myself vowing to love and honor some old driveling idiot of 60, to be taken into his harem and enjoy the pleasure of being his favorite sultana for an hour and then thrown aside whilst my godly husband is out sparking another girl in hopes of getting another victim to his despotic power. Pleasant prospect, I must say. There's a lot of underlining through all of this, and <laughs> even some double underlining. And this, Joe, this is of God. So Joseph F. Smith, to her, is Joe. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And this, Joe, this is of God, is it? No, never. Never, never, you may preach, you may talk to me from now to eternity, but you never will make me believe that polygamy is true. Okay. Wow. So, 
you, me, you wonder, did she talk with her mother about polygamy? Did she have a bad experience, you know, seeing polygamy happening in, in Utah when she spent a year or two in Utah? You know, it's, it's hard to tell. But um, so we have Joseph F.'s responses, and um, he's, you know, he's a very devout Mormon, and he very strongly defends polygamy. But that was a 16-year-old girl writing, you know, she was a brilliant person. And, uh, and Joseph F. was a very strong-minded, you know, and a very well-educated person, too. So they were interesting cousins. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> um, so when I did the reading at, at Sunstone, we had readings after I kind of introduced this book. And uh, I had one of the women defending polygamy. <laughs> but that was, I'll just tell about it, that was Eliza R. Snow. And, you know, like in the 1870s and 1880s, and uh, there was a group of non-Mormon women who started this anti-polygamy society and had these meetings. And that made the Mormon women mad, and so they had these meetings in favor of polygamy and defending polygamy. And so Eliza Partridge Lyman was asked to be part of this, and she spoke, and she wrote a talk, and it's in her diary. So we have it preserved, and so it's in here. And, um, you know, she talked about how, you know, people say that our kids are not as, our polygamous kids are not as good as yours, and they're every bit as good. <laughs> and, um, and talked about how polygamy, you know, the Mormon doctrine was you had to be a polygamist to enter you know, the celestial kingdom, you know, how it was an important part of our religion. So that's kind of the other side to this funny attack by Ina. And so the whole book is full of these great documents from women who really come alive. And it's great to read the whole documents. So I recommend <laughs> In Sacred Loneliness, the documents. There we are. Yes. And it's, yeah, because it just came out um, in print just this week, right? right. So. Yeah. I should say a little bit more about it. Um, when I was doing the research for the first book, I was, as I say, the, the um, internet was not really too operational back then. And um, so no, there were no primary documents on the internet. And so... I would just go around to different different archives and uh, get these primary documents and then type out the whole document if I could. You know, if it was a letter, you could type out the whole document. Sometimes autobiographies. Sometimes diaries were so long you couldn't type out the whole thing, so you read through and took notes. And so anyway, but I, I took a lot of... I transcribed a lot of complete documents and uh, my friend Joe Geisner asked me to write an article about how I wrote that first book. Yeah, writing so, Mormon history, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just saying. <laughs> I thought you were pointing to yeah. it. And uh, it's a great book. And um, I need to get Joe on. <laughs> and so as, as I was writing that article, I went back into my computer files and I found a lot of these documents, and I thought, you know, these should be published. You know, I public; they're already transcribed. You know, mm -hmm. all I need to do is collect them and do some, you know, identifying, you know, annotation, identifying odd words and, and women and men, and and um, and so uh, signature books. Gary Bergera was interested, so I collected them all together and and um, it came out just the 12th what is that six days ago yeah. almost a week yeah. so. and it's just a short thousand pages no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 600 pages but then there's a lot of notes and uh -huh. I put in some useful um, appendices too. Right, right you have the Brigham Young Wives with footnotes and Hebrew C. Kimball Wives with footnotes so it's that it should be a good reference book also. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. 
Well, Dr. Todd Compton, I really appreciate you taking so much time and sitting down with us and sharing your uh, your book with us. So, thanks a lot for being Thank on you. Gospel Tangents. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Todd Compton. If you haven't, get his newest book, In Sacred Loneliness, The Documents. You can learn more about these amazing women. And also, don't forget, uh, this is now <laughs> over 20 years old now, just plain old In Sacred Loneliness, so you can find out more uh, about Joseph Smith's wives in both of these amazing books. So. Anyway, thanks again, Todd. Really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to have to talk a little bit about Jacob Hamblin. I'm going to get my hands on that book, and uh, maybe we'll have you back on in a few months. So, thanks again. In our next conversation, we're going to stick with polygamy, this time going from uh, historical polygamy to current polygamy. I'm excited to have the grandson of Rulin Allred on the show. So, my name is Joe Jessup. My full name is Joseph Lyman Jessup. Um, and I have two polygamous grandfathers on both sides, on my father's side and my uh, mother's side. On my mother's side, well, let's start with father's side because the mother's side's a little bit more famous. Uh, on the father's side is Joseph Lyman Jessup, uh, and on the, uh, my mother's side is Rulin Clark Allred. So, and as some people know, or probably most people know, he was the polygamous leader of the AUB group, or quote unquote, the All Red Group during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and then was shot and killed in 1977. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com, and if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.